session just for everybody know and then you'll you'll be notified and no worries that as summer you can help out as long as you can but i i'll be watching that too and facilitating hi everyone we're recording now so you know um my name is uh farina king in Navajo, we introduce ourselves by clan, so I'll do that. She Bilagana Nishle, Dokiaani Bashishin, Bilagana Dashache, Dosinijani Dashanolit, Akut Ego Atsah Nishle. And that's an important way of our oral tradition, our oral history, is I just um, introduce myself, reaching out to my relatives that I am of white English American settler descent through my mother and born for the Towering House clan and Black Street Woods people of Diné as citizen of Navajo Nation. And I'm chiming in um, from Cherokee country. I'm in Cherokee Nation and United Kutua Band of Cherokees. So I always think about as uh, I'm an associate professor of Native American history and indigenous studies at Northeastern State University. That's often in my mind, a little background about me. I also um, got involved with the Southwest Oral History Association why we're here today celebrating the big 40 of soha it's um a very you know capstone year in that way of course the white elephant in the room is always an ongoing horrific pandemic that has been so challenging and very detrimental to especially um, disproportionately black indigenous peoples of color um, and diverse peoples uh, who have been historically excluded, marginalized and oppressed. So I, I certainly always have that in mind. Um, and it was these kind of questions and my interests in indigenous communities that actually connected me to with the Southwest Oral History Association is I've always been drawn to organizations that show they value Native American oral history and indigenous oral histories, and also the voices of historically marginalized and um, suppressed peoples. And I could tell SOHA did that because they had different grants and scholarships supporting oral historians. And then I always loved oral history. So I was excited to learn about such a, you know, tight knit group and supportive group of oral historians who are welcoming and um, willing, you know, to learn and share with each other. And I know Oral History Association, OHA, is also very much like that. And it's great that SOHA has all kinds of partnerships and we do co-sponsorships with OHA. This is not the first time that oh, SOHA is one of the co-sponsors of the OHA conference. Um, we were able to support the meeting in Salt Lake City pre-COVID and that was wonderful and having a really great show there. And this is a part of several various SOHA affiliated sessions here at the OHA virtual conference. So I'm just really excited and glad um, to be a part of this virtual gathering, being able to come together using technologies to be safe and well. And it's with much honor and joy, a pleasure for me to um, introduce this panel of past presidents from the Southwest Oral History Association. And I'm very honored to um, be among them as the current president of SOHA at, at this seminal, you know, significant time um, for us to stop and reflect, think about SOHA over the years. I mean, 40 years, wow, that's incredible for an organization that's gone through so much um, and in the field of oral history that still has its doubters, you know, has people um, very critical and questioning that in, in history and the different approaches to it. So it's it's really quite an accomplishment and amazing. All the people, especially those on our panel today, past presidents, and we have our first vice president, Summer Chairlin, um, who's on with us too, that, you know, the future of SOHA and really exciting happenings. I must say though, before I turn the time over to our panelists and kind of make this more of an open-ended conversation that we will give time about, you know, eight minutes, eight to 10 minutes on from each of our panelists, Sarah Moorhead, 
Karen Harper, Jennifer um, Keel, and Juan Coronado, that we will give them each about some time, you know, to introduce themselves, to share their most um, memorable moments, insights of serving as presidents of SOHA over the years. Um, that before I do that, we definitely want to do a shout out and remind folks that the call for proposals for our SOHA 2022 conference, which will be held at our host institution, which we are also very grateful for, another uh, big part of the SOHA story at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas, in the libraries there, the lead library. And Summer and Ryan Marini, who is our current treasurer, uh, they are the co-chairs of our program and they are accepting proposals already um, I think in the chat, yep, Summer, thank you, added in the chat the um, link to our SOHA news blog that has more information, the call for proposals, that it's not just formal formal papers, but we are trying the best to really um, emulate the model SOHA setting with this conference, you know, with being open-ended with different kinds of formats and kinds of sessions that we can have. So it's really great to see that here in this conference. And we hope to continue those kind of approaches with the SOHA 2022 conference. And something that's exciting about it is it will be our first time doing a hybrid conference. Um, Summer, did you want to say anything else pitching this? Because I know you've been working so diligently on this. Any other points you want to highlight? Sure, just we welcome proposals from any uh, stage in the game. If you're a community historian, if you're a student, if you're a longtime practitioner and academic, we really, so how's open to all sorts of research and people. And we are home to historians in and of the Southwest. So if you are studying the Southwest, that's great, but you live in another community, that's fine. Or if you live in the Southwest, but you don't study the Southwest, still come. We'd love to have you. And yes, as Farina shared, it's a hybrid conference. We will have virtual and in-person components. So if you're not able to attend in person, though, why wouldn't you come to Vegas in the spring? I don't know. Uh, we would be happy to host you virtually as well. Thank you, Summer. And for all your work in the program committee doing that, um, something a little different is they have a form that people submit that way, not traditionally a lot of times you send it to an email this time they have a form and they are accepting proposals already and a special approach to that this year is they will already tell you if you're accepted or not um, sooner uh, than previously on a rolling is it a rolling basis is how you'd say it yep we'll be accepting proposals on a rolling basis and we'll let people know as early as december so get those proposals in early so you can get that information to your institution if you need travel support Wonderful. And you have up until January 15th, 2022 to submit. Uh, SOHA also has different funding opportunities and the mini grant for 2022 is a, a grant we offer to support different oral historians in their projects. I, I'm a fortunate recipient of that and it really made a difference in my work. And I know others here have been recipients too. Um, and we are honoring our awardees tomorrow in the award ceremony. So please join us then. Karen will be a part of that, introducing um, the Mink awardee, Dr. Francisco Badarama. So we're really excited to be able to hear from him. All right. Well, as I said already, we also want this to feel conversational. You know, yes. Um, show respect and, and mute your mics when you're not speaking so we don't hear you doing the dishes or the cat or dog barking in the background. Um, so just remember that because it does not automatically mute you when you come in. Um, so if you just pay attention to muting and unmuting, that's just something I noticed in, in different sessions. So thank you for that. And But we do welcome and, and we'll watch the chat if you have any questions or comments you want to make. And I'll be helping you know, to facilitate the conversation as I'm chairing, um, chiming in with my own thoughts, sharing them. But we are certainly open to other memories people have here. If we have others who have been active mem members or involved in SOHA over the years, or you're just here learning about it for the first time, welcome. We're excited to have this conversation with you. And I do have to say, you know, before 
um, starting off, I'll, I'll just, I'm putting on my teacher mode, my educator mode. <laughs> I'm just gonna call on our, our panelists to each take a turn. So they're ready, you know, on top of their, on, on their toes. Um, but I, I am going to emphasize here that it's been wonderful to get to know each of these panelists who are here today the all the sacrifice it really is that you know there's a point where of course you you serve in these leadership leadership positions and there's so much you benefit from it's reciprocal and you grow and you learn from it but there is sacrifice from that individual who really puts themselves out there as a president and is the one uh, staying up all night because they know they're going to point the finger at them if they didn't get that report in or if that event didn't come through. And I know each of these individuals were in that hot seat, you know, really having to go to the grill and push hard uh, to get things to happen. Of course, they didn't do it alone. It all depends on the members, all the collaborations and partnerships and support. But they really have been each, you know, these spearheads of um, helping to break the ice, being icebreakers at moments and rallying people. And in Diné culture, as I've shared before, even in this group, I've often thought about that idea of how a Diné leader and someone who is a warrior in ways is someone who unifies people and reminds them we're family, reminds them we're community. And I actually shared that in a conversation about one of our SOHA, um, conference themes, because I thought of the people I've been meeting, like, like Karen, Sarah, Jennifer, and Juan in Soha and Summer and so many others um, who have really shown that quality of being able to bring people together who have very different backgrounds, very different viewpoints and, and opinions. And they've been wonderful at gathering people and bringing up great ideas and putting in so much work, but also through that, you know, finesse and navigating um, organizations, the mechanics of them, where there can be some of those real hard times and challenges, which I'm sure we'll hear about. And I'm excited to, as they've been members themselves, as they've served in different capacities, treasurer, president, or whatever it is, program co-chairs, um, they, it's, it's more than even just being president. They've done so much and been also incredible oral historians who have been examples through their work and community uh, relationships that they've sustained through all this, companies, uh, books published or projects, oral histories they've done too. So thank you so much. Ahyehe. I, I recognize each of you and I'm so honored to be in this room with you. And I, I appreciate this opportunity that we can actually recognize, you know, in a moment because we just sometimes assume there's those expressions of gratitude, but we can't always assume, right? Uh, so I, I'm going to start with Sarah. Do you want to go first? And then we'll go to Karen, uh, Juan, and Jennifer. Uh, Sarah, you're on mute still. Can you unmute? I know it's okay. there. Is that working now? Yes, we okay. hear you. Okay. okay, I'm seeing Keith's face in front of my computer, but we're over here on the right. Um, okay, so just to um, introduce myself a little bit, my name is Sarah Moorhead. I'm a retired public librarian many years ago, and my last position was to work in the local history room, which fit perfectly with oral history. And it was an opportunity to use the library to pay for transcriptions and archive our oral histories. And so uh, that actually was a, a wonderful end to my career. Uh, my presidential term was in 2008 to 2009. And we focused in on balancing the budget between expenses and income. It doesn't sound very exciting, but you know, it is important, actually. And um, so it's really easy just to slide down into the red unless you kind of really work hard to keep that from happening. Um, the most in the income that we get primarily and also expenses is from the conference. And of course, that 
didn't fit with a pandemic. But we, um, <clears throat> that's really hard, um, particularly if you don't have any institutional support, which we haven't had in most of the states for a long time. Nevada has done a terrific job of that, particularly Carol Zajac, who went to the administration and got a graduate assistant. Anthony's been a wonderful help to us, as have the other graduate assistants, and office space, and help in the oral history room, and, um, and it also helps us with some funding and with uh, our conferences to give us some free space, which is really major. That's how we help to do it. Um, so the other major thing on our agenda was updating the Constitution and bylaws. The board went through it in a couple of sessions, and then we brought it to the members, and they accepted it. It hadn't been done in quite a while. So there were things in there that were really outdated. We also had continued to support the Eva Tulane Watt Award. That was what uh, Farina was talking about, that how she came. Uh, she was a recipient of that. It's for Native Americans. And it is um, was instituted by Mary Pavlovsky and Keith Basso. They had originally donated the money to bring Mrs. Watt to OHA um, because she had won the book award, but she was unable to go, also unable to go to so hard accept the award because of her health. And so they decided to donate the money with the idea that it would come to bring Native Americans to our conference. And that was a wonderful gift to us and the first year, somehow, they didn't find anybody, but since then, we've done well. And particularly, I have to thank Farina because she has not only um, participated in, in finding people who might want to uh, get that award, but others to pre other Native Americans to present. And they've been a very strong presence at our conference, which is totally appropriate because the oral history is such a tradition among Native Americans. <clears throat> so the biggest challenge that we had during this time was a lack of leadership in the 2009 conference. And um, that was difficult because it was in California that year. And we were looking around for somebody new to take over and be conference chair actually the first vice president is always in charge of the conference, but it's very hard if that person lives in another state because we are four states. And um, so anyway, we selected somebody and he said, yeah, he thought he could do it. It turns out that he had only been program chair on another organization. So that was a little hard for him. And then not long into the planning period, he decided to move to Texas, <laughs> which was kind of, you know, didn't help too much for planning the conference. And Karen has always been our mainstay. She's been with SOHA for a very long time. And, but her mother was dying in Arizona. There was no way she could possibly do it at that time. Later on, maybe uh, January, February in there, uh, Karen was able to come and just sort of give us a boost and get us going. And in the end of the conference went very well, it was at USC, but a lot of the volunteers in California sort of felt mm, neglected, adrift or whatever. Um, so that was hard, it turned out okay, but um, that was a little bit of a difficulty. And I would just like to say that SOA has been um, actually, um, Farina asked us to talk about networks and so has been the primary network. It's just a wonderful organization. It's of course, it's easier if it's in person and you can meet people and follow up on conversations. And sometimes that works too with the, virtual, but it's certainly not as easy. Uh, you know, you may not have a, somebody doesn't write down their email address or their phone number or whatever for you. And um, it's just, 
I'm, I've been in it now for 20 years. And the main reason is it has a culture of being supportive and giving constructive ideas and not tearing people down. I keep hearing about the academic ones where I think people somehow get points for attacking people, which is kind of horrible to hear. Maybe it's not quite that bad, but that just is, does, is a no-go in Soho. We just don't do that. And that encourages people to stay with the organization. Um, I've heard other officers who used to be there and say, oh, I want to come back. I, I love Soho. So, and of course, I told you about the library that worked out well, and the Mesa Historical Society was my other network. It was really kind of hard to get people to actually do the interviewing, but we did have a lot of meetings and they would help with ideas. If somebody said, well, I, I talked to these people and they just didn't want to say anything and they would come up with some ideas to help them. But uh, so it has been the primary um, network and um, I encourage everyone out there who may not be a member now uh, to join us and we look forward to having you. That's all. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you, Sarah. Um, and then do you want to go ahead, Karen? If I unmute, sure. Yes, very <laughs> good. Hello, everyone. Um, in the land acknowledgement, I want to state that I'm, I am on unceded Tongva land in Long Beach, California, and I honor all the ancestors and current Tongva people for the use of your land, not very graciously many times. Um, in a contribution to that, I have written a children's book on Lillian Robles, who was one of the, the movers and shakers in prote protecting sacred sites in Long Beach. And she is now an ancestor, but we're still doing her work. Um, back to Soha. So I have been on the board. I'm the relic. I've been here the longest. I joined the board in the 1990s when I was in graduate school. I had no clue what it really meant to be on a board. And, and there was very little training on how to be on a board at the time. You just kind of figured it out. Um, Indira Bernstein was our secretary and she was doing oral histories at Taliesin and West. So we got to have our board meetings at Taliesin and West. We got to spend the night. We got to be there on the Saturday formal once a one weekend of the month where we dressed in formal clothes. Our president Brad Williams dressed in a tuxedo we got to eat in the theater and, and experience the performances. And I always figured that was the best reason to join SOHA at the time, because you got to experience the, the, uh, the commune where in this place, everybody is recognized as an artist and they try to live in support of each other in the most artistic way. So, I mean, that was fabulous. We were so sad when Indra decided that she'd done the secretary for long enough and we had to figure out other ways to have places to have our meetings. So one of the things that we have done over the years often is we have had meetings in other people's homes. Even when I wasn't president at one point, the board meeting was at my house and several of the people spent the night. So it's, it's that, like Sarah talks about this community that we've created and we become dear friends in the process, many of us. So that was one of the things I wanted to start with. Um, challenges I wanted to talk about briefly. Of course, all the intricacies of putting on a conference is probably the major challenge to have it be a success and have it work and to bring diversity and um, to make everyone feel welcome. And I think SOA does a pretty good job of that, but it's always a challenge. I always like to say to people, I know you all want to sit with your buddies and just visit with them, but you're on the board. 
it's your job to go out and make these new people feel welcome as well. And we've done that. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the experiments that we tried to do while I was a president. One of those, and, and the, a part of this with the conferences is always to pry, try to find an economical place that works. So that's always a huge challenge. So one year, I don't know if many of you went that I probably none of you who are here, that we had it at the uh, Placita in downtown LA. So we had some of the sessions in the um, Cultura building that is now a Mexican American museum. We had some of the sessions in the church next door. We had, there was a third place, crazy place where we had sessions. And then having a historical place to have the president's reception was always a challenge. And it was at the oldest house in LA, the Avila house, so cool. But Melanie Sturgeon and I, in unloading all the supplies, got $900 in tickets for parking in the wrong place. Because <laughs> we did all the catering ourselves in, in those buildings. Ay, ay, ay. Um, okay, another experiment. We, we had a conference in Santa Fe where we were joint sponsors with Applied Anthropology. So it was great to get to exotic Santa Fe, but a, Applied Anthropology organization was so much bigger that our needs were kind of subsumed um, and we had a much lower turnout, maybe 60 people. And another interesting challenge that came up then was we brought people on scholarship who went to their session and spent the whole rest of the time being tourists and didn't go to any other sessions. And that's happened with other scholarship winners. So we've tried to figure out strategies to let these people know we're bringing you to person participate in the whole conference. And one of those strategies is to ask them to write articles for the newsletter and to try to educate them that, yeah, you know, we didn't bring you to go shopping. We brought you to be part of it. Um, oh, I, I decided one year we needed to go to Tucson when Arizona, oh, we would alternate between a region in California because so many of the members were in California until really the few California people get to got totally burned out and that model changed. So I decided we need to go to Tucson. I found this fabulous historic inn, it had 22 rooms, which was our historic number that we usually reserved. It would mean that some of the sessions were under a Palo Verde tree in a courtyard. I just thought this is gonna be great. Well, Noel Stoll, who ran the public program at ASU, said to me, if you have it in Tucson, we will pull all our support and everybody in Arizona out of the organization. I went to the University of Arizona. I didn't realize the hostilities between the two institutions was that deep. So flipped, had the, had the conference in Tempe at the uh, uh, Fiesta Inn, which is where we've had it many times. And it ended up being a conference that 120 people came to. So it turned out okay, but oh my God, that really was a shock. Um, okay, another example. Um, I was president during that transition when universities no longer funded people to go to several conferences. And so this institutional support that we'd been riding on disappeared. So it was a real challenge to try, try to figure out how to go forward. And if we could even go forward, if we would even survive. So one of the things that somebody suggested is that to get together all the past presidents, which we did at Steve Novak's house in downtown LA and brainstorm about what each of those presidents had hoped would happen and could happen. Now, do I remember all the things we came up with? No, but one of them was to have an executive secretary. So we tried to figure out where to get the money to pay for one and we started looking into having one and it took a long time to really get that working. So having UNLV provide a home 
and to provide a graduate student. I mean, this is, it's huge because we struggled without all that support for so long. Um, if I've been talking too long, um, tell me to shut up. But one of the interesting things was leadership. You're good, you're good. You have about uh, five more minutes, uh, four minutes, yeah. Oha, Mary Larson, are you still here? Kept stealing our leaders. So we were all hoping Mary Larson would be president. No, she goes on to the board of OHA. Art Hansen ends up going to be president of OHA. So OHA looks at us as an incubator for leadership. I looked at it, yikes, you're taking our people. We still need them. <laughs> um, one of the other leadership challenges, I'm an indis independent oral historian, self-funded. You know, I thank my day job for funding me for this. The kindness of my parents for funding me in this work. Um, so it was a real leap. Um, boy, did I have to work on Sarah. Boy, did I have to work on Jean Maria Arrigo to convince them that they could be president because I did without having that institutional support. So, and it's nice to have that mix because we've always been welcoming to those that don't, that aren't in institutions, that are individual practitioners. Um, so Jean Maria ended up, Arrigo ended up taking over and doing the procedures manual, which apparently people have lost the knowledge that's there, but put a lot of work into it. Sarah, you know, brought her own steady analysis and outreach particularly to Native Americans to hugely enrich the organization. So we have proven that those without institutional support can do this job. It's harder, but we can. Um, I ended up serving three terms, one just me. And then part of this leadership solution was to have co-presidents and that worked pretty well. And, and it was my suggestion because you really learn the job the first year you're president, the second year, you really know what you're doing, that it kind of made sense to have a two-year term. But that burden on everybody of all those years of commitment, I sort of apologize for that. I, I don't know how well it's working and it can be rethought. But anyway, um, other thing I wanted to mention, let's see. We, I was president at the time when technology was just arriving. People were just getting their emails. We were, transition, we were transitioning to having a website. And the webmaster kept asking me, what do you want on it? I, I didn't have a clue. I, it's a wonderful website now. I mean, the transition is huge. Going to the newsletter by email was kind of a long transition, but we were in those places. Hard to remember back to that. Um, whew, we survived some tough conflicts, as Sarah said, where we ended up with people who were in charge of the conference that didn't want to listen to any of our wisdom and past experience to make it financially successful. So we had a couple of years where we lost a lot of money because it was so important to them to have keynote speakers that cost a lot of money in times when people didn't even come rather than our old model is we use the Mink awardee as a keynote speaker, somebody from inside who has really important stories to tell us from our region. So that's always still kind of a conflict. Do we do that? Do we spend the money on it? How much does it cost? And, and then if the Mink awardee gets short shrift because there isn't time, that really bothers me. Um, I wonder a thing that I'm really proud of Jean Maria, particularly Arrigo, brought performance to our conferences. She deals in such difficult material that she figured the only way to present it was with this slight removal in performance. So for a number of years, we always made sure we had a performance slot, either as a plenary or a session. And then we had a performance workshops where people came and brought their material and developed them and by the end of the conference performed them. And I'm, I'm very proud of that, that model. Um, one of them particularly poignant, Mary Melcher did research on 
the uh, migration, the Dust Bowl migration of people that pass through Arizona and settle in Arizona instead of making it to California. And with her material, we developed this whole Reader's Theater. And one of the things, innovative things that we did was we realized there's the people who died, therefore they're not in our collections. And we represented that group of people by a, a narrator who narrated the oral histories as the one looking down who didn't make it. Interesting creativity. Um, scholarship money to bring diversity. When I first arrived there, this was not a diverse organization. So we've worked on reaching out and making diverse people feel welcome. And I, I think SOHA has made huge progress in that area. And scholarships are one of the key ways that we did that. Um, one of the things that I discovered in putting on a conference that people would show up that needed to be funded, but it was too late for the scholarships. So figuring out ways to fund that. And one of those examples is six black people from Pacoima, elders who came and presented at one of our conferences. And um, Jean Maria's mother provided housing so that they didn't have to pay for housing. And then, and bringing five Navajo sixth graders to present on their work. They came at least two years in a row. Their teacher would combine it with um, a, a, a trip exploring the whole area. So we would get them for a few minutes. Another thing I wanted to mention is, um, Dan Kaloran, who is the past president, was a student at the conference in Albuquerque. And I just happened to be visiting with him as I walked down the aisle and he, uh, down the hallway. And he said, you know, you ought to have a student rep. I wasn't, finally, I wasn't on the board anymore, but I was presumptuous enough to walk into the board meeting and introduce Dan and the board voted to have a student rep and elected him as student rep. And eventually he became president of the organization. So I wanted to sum up with deep, deep friendships occur as a result of this organization because we care about stories, we care about caring for each other and it, it's incredibly enriching. And another wonderful thing is to watch a student who comes and presents and grows into marvelous professionals that then give back to the organization. And you guys, that's who you are. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Karen. Wonderful. So many stories there, stories within stories. So I'm like, oh my goodness, what did you do with the $900 <laughs> or all these, all these uh, excitement, you know, the, the hurdles you have to go through, the walls that you have to navigate in all these different dynamics. And then, you know, the beauty and creations and um, the friendships, the family you find along the way. That's wonderful. All right, um, then Juan, can we hear from you? And, and then we'll hear from Jennifer. Uh, buenas tardes to those of you in the East. Uh, buenos dias to, to those of you in the, in the, in the West. Uh, where I come from, uh, it's still good morning if you haven't had lunch, so good morning it is. Uh, it's been a long day here. Uh, Karen just brings an energy. Once she arrives at, at a conference, whether it's Soha or Oha, you know, you could feel her presence. Like Karen has arrived, and, uh, you know, I miss that. Uh, but I, I got to mention, uh, if there would be such a thing as a Soha godmother or Soha madrina, uh, to me, that is Sarah Morehead. Uh, she has been very close and dear to, to, to my inclusion in, in, into Soha. Uh, and I, I owe a, a lot to Soha as far as my, as my, my rise in academia. Uh, I'm an assistant professor of Latino and, and, and public history at Central Connecticut State University in New Britain, uh, Connecticut. Uh, I've been here two years, uh, and uh, uh, Soha's place in, in my life, I think, has led to me being where I'm at today. Uh, and it all started with Sarah. Uh, I was a freshly minted PhD back in 2014. 
Uh, I was working as, an, as a lecturer, uh, teaching a ton of classes uh, with no research money, uh, no travel money. And uh, I read a posting Sarah had, left, le uh, had posted in one of the Latino listservs that had been disseminated. Uh, and I applied for uh, a scholarship that uh, SOHA uh, was trying to bring in folks to apply for the conference in, in Tempe in, in 2014. And I applied, I, I, I received it. And uh, along with a very generous donor out, out, of, Temp, uh, out of Mesa, uh, M M M Mesa, uh, Arizona, or M Mesa, <laughs> uh, and Wayne, uh, Wayne uh, Palmer. He was a World War II uh, veteran and, and he was very generous to Soha for, for many, Wayne Pomeroy, I think I got it right. Uh, and uh, with that scholarship money and Wayne's donation, uh, I was able to present my work at, at, at SOHA. Uh, and I think it was a game changer because prior to that, um, as a grad student, I had gone to a few, uh, few conferences and, uh, you know, some of these academic conferences weren't the nicest, you know, and, and I, I'll admit, you know, I don't think my confidence was uh, where it needed to be. And uh, I had been roughed up a little bit of, uh, with life at the time. And uh, Soha gave me uh, a second lifeline uh, in academia. And uh, Soha allowed me to, to share my research. And it, it really got me thinking of, you know, New Horizons, right? Uh, and I was able to network uh, with the people there. And it, it uh, I just felt a, a very comfortable environment where I could grow as, as, a, as a young scholar. And, and I appreciate uh, Sarah's role in, in allowing me uh, that opportunity. Uh, and I think, uh, Farina, I think you received a scholarship that same year. And I, I think uh, that's where we met. And uh, every year after that, you know, I kept going back to SOHA. Uh, and then got me integrated with the OHA folks. Uh, and then of course got me to, to different places in, in, in my academic journey, right? And it got me applying for, for, for different positions. Uh, and then it, it allowed me to move, take on leadership roles in SOHA uh, as, a, as a, you know, uh, second uh, VP, first VP. And then finally as co-president with Dr. Uh, Marcy Gallo from 2017 to 2019. And it, it's been great experience from planning conferences to being on, on uh, all types of committees, scholarship committees, and things like that. And, and it's, been, uh, it's been a very good journey for me. You know, it, it gave me good experience and I'm, I'm eternally indebted to Sarah Moorhead and to, to, to Soha uh, for uh, what they've done and they've helped me out in, in, in this journey. Uh, a beautiful thing about Soha is just how friendly we are and, and how uh, helpful we are and, and we try to open doors for people uh, academically speaking and research wise and, and just, you know, talking about our work and, and being in, in, in this group with great energy, positive energy, I think is extremely helpful, right? Uh, one thing that I'll mention about SOHA and uh, I think we need to celebrate it. Uh, we need to celebrate uh, the heavy lifting that the women of SOHA bring to the table. Uh, like in many places in our society and our universities, uh, women do a lot of the heavy lifting. And, and we definitely have that uh, at SOHA. And, and we don't often uh, celebrate uh, all the great work that goes behind the scenes in, in putting a conference together, and putting a panel together. Uh, and my experience at SOHA has been extremely uh, positive because uh, of, of mentors like Sarah, Marcy, uh, Carol, Clay T, uh, uh, and, and of course, uh, the women who are on this panel as well, because they do so much heavy lifting for our organization. So thank you. Uh, as as co-president, uh, we definitely wanted uh, to, to grow our, our, our institution. Uh, the institutional knowledge that Karen and Sarah bring, of course, it just goes beyond, right? Uh, they can go back and talk about what SOHO was doing, you know, 15, 20 years ago and say, hey, you know what, California isn't, hasn't always been friendly to us, but hey, maybe we can do uh, a conference in Fullerton like we did a few years ago. Uh, Vegas is give or take, but hey, we're going to be there next, uh, next, next spring, right? 
Uh, Arizona has always been friendly, and and uh, and of course this goes hand in hand with the folks who work there. Uh, so 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 we've gone to Arizona from time 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 and time again, right? Uh, but uh, but yeah, you know, I I think my my work uh, with Soha and the opportunities that they've given me uh, have enabled me uh, to slowly climb up uh, uh, where I am uh, professionally speaking. Uh, and, and like I said, I am in, indebted to the organization. Uh, a few other things that uh, we managed to grow in the last few years. Uh, one thing that we tried to address, uh, we realized how big of a contribution uh, indigenous people and Na Native Americans play to, to SOHA. So a few years ago, we said, hey, it, it would only make sense to have uh, a Native American representative uh, in, in the group. Right? We had a representative out of, out of California, Nevada, uh, Arizona, New Mexico. They always leave us Texans behind because they don't think we're part of the Southwest, but we, we sure are. Uh, but I understand Texas has its own thing, right? Uh, but we thought that it would be a great idea to include a, a Native American representative, and we did, uh, because they play a, a vital role in, in, in SOHA, right? Uh, but you know, I really do miss you guys. I, I miss uh, having the in-person conferences. Uh, I've had, uh, you know, the ability to work with Karen. You know, when we were out in uh, Long Beach, uh, we we had, I think we were celebrating our 35th anniversary. That was five years ago already. And, you know, we had an incredible celebration out there. And, you know, just the opportunity to, you know, for, for, for a junior, junior scholar, uh, just, having the opportunity to, to contribute and, and, and learn how to, you know, set up uh, a program like that has, has just been priceless to me. Uh, the other beautiful thing about SOHA is how inclusive we are. Uh, not everyone is an academic and, and that's great. You know, we, we need to begin uh, being inclusive of, of, of those practitioners uh, in our community uh, who, who do great work, who have e extensive knowledge uh, of the community who have done uh, a lot of the work that we do as scholars as well. Uh, and we welcome those folks in, at, at SOHA and, and of course here at, at, at OHA as well, right? Uh, I think uh, we're living in very difficult times. We've, we've lived in very difficult times for a while, very divisive times. Uh, but from an academic point of view, uh, we face hardships, you know, going back to the 08, 09 recession, uh, moving forward to the, res the the economic issues that we face under COVID, and you know it it has been uh, it, it monetarily speaking uh, sometimes it is a challenge to bring in people uh, to present their work. Uh, so I I'm glad that we're able to offer scholarships, uh, mini grants uh, that brings a, a, a more diverse uh, population. Uh, into our, our conferences. And I think uh, we do tremendous work uh, in that regard. Uh, but uh, thank you uh, for giving me a, a few few minutes uh, to talk on this panel. And uh, we'll, 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 I'll pass the torch on to, uh, to, to Jennifer. Guten Tag, I wanna <laughs> celebrate my own culture today. Soha has helped me become more into like my community's history, my family's history that I'm surrounded. Literally, I've been working on genealogical projects for my family. And I feel like I've become more and more em embraced in the, the understanding the sacred, the communal part of land acknowledgement. I'm on Ahayashman native lands today in Dana Point, California. And we work on oral history projects um, as a community, as a county, and we're working in Orange County's diverse, growing population and bringing land acknowledgement through the diversity of our oral history projects. And I am so grateful that in my graduate studies, I had an opportunity to attend the OHA meeting in Oklahoma City and make acquaintance with many of you. And Karen Harper approached me after my graduate seminar session with um, Cora Granada and some others that have continued to shape and mentor me in so many ways that she said, you know, we have a regional conference. You didn't have to go nearly as far to share your research today. <laughs> and I said, really? And you mentioned, Karen, oh, it's going to be in Tempe and um, I'm native Phoenician. So I'm so 
oh, lovely. I mean, <laughs> it's going to be fun to be back home and, you know, connect with family and friends. Maybe they might be able to get a sense of what I'm doing professionally. And so it was that year um, I had an opportunity to share and get involved from there. And I thought, you know, that was really remarkable what you all produced. And I really enjoyed the, the caliber of scholarship and just the, the networking and the training, the workshops. And so as a graduate student at the Center for Home Public History, I thought, you know, if I can re invite fam like colleagues to this and um, family who lives in the area, you know, this would make all of us more sensible to understand our family's heritage and roots and community. So it, it gave me a platform. So how it allowed me to network and reach out to a lot of groups that I probably on my own um, might have approached, but I don't think so. I think I was more opt to say, you know, there's a network with resources and trainings and conferences, and we have diversity and scholarships, and we're trying to make this practice um, as widely diverse. And so I've invited filmmakers to students to grassroots activists to our conference. And it's just sort of this idea, they say, why this form? You know, we have folklore, we have anthropologists, we are um, unique in our own way. And so it's been really great to explain the methodology and provide workshops at conferences and mini workshops that allow us to celebrate the, the this core of our training and why we, we do it in this format. And so I grabbed in, you know, in this session today, I was thinking last time we were together, would it have been Salt Lake, you know, in my award um, reception bulletin here. And I was looking at all the past presidents' names. Today, we're thinking about all these many individuals and the work that each of you all did with each of these boards. But it's so amazing to see um, familiar names and Wendy Elliott Scheinberg, I just reconnected with. Um, she was one of my professors at Cal State Fullerton, and she's continued to shape my work in genealogy. And so, and just endless names of, from Arthur Hansen to Lawrence DeGraff, who are my namesakes to the center where I studied public history and oral history methods. And Natalie Fasakis, who we rejoined in 2018, and we had a conference with my alma mater and working with students and having them intern and learn about how do you even proctor and create a, a program and reserve space to catering? You all have that knowledge base, <laughs> your professional coordinators among your professional academic titles. And it's sort of this unspoken that you become um, diverse in your skill sets as you lead in, in this board position. And so recruitment is caught, like one of the key parts of this position too. I think of each of you, the roles that you've played in bringing in new um, and younger students who are just brand new to the practice and giving them a chance to sit on a committee and letting them rise to the occasion, becoming board members, to becoming leaders, and just really carrying on the torch. And so you see talent, and you've certainly recruited us in this and the session and those who aren't able to join us, but hopefully we'll see this virtual program. We celebrate that incredible 40 years of um, tremendous impact um, to many communities and the diversity of the collections that we, we have. So I'm really happy that I met you all and just had a, an opportunity to, to work with Farina on that 2020 virtual conference. I can't believe that we had to pivot through COVID. Um, I never imagined my, my position as president from 19 to 21 would entail this. And I think that having technology and because Sarah and Karen were able to have a website and develop you know, digital financing and all this infrastructure and have an institutional home and Carol to continue to um, advocate with um, Clay T for this. We were in a position because of Zoom technology and your ability to lecture online already, you were already fluid in this. And so Brina was like, well, you know, we just pivot. Like, okay, <laughs> I wanted to be in Vegas with you all institutional home, but, when we had these many submissions, you cannot stop the opportunity to share and showcase the work of our grant um, awardees and MINK awardees. And so I think that's pretty much what you learn is to um, just adapt to it. And I mean, goodness, we're reflecting on this year and virtually because this is an amazing way that we can still work together. But we certainly have seen a lot, you know, this is just really, but we, 
we went over this mountain together and we're going to continue to support each other through this. So I think that's really, I think the SOHA base has always understood um, that we do it together. And so I think the, the, the work we do, we, when you start your first interview to creating a collection, um, we support each other's work. And I think that's what makes this network so meaningful is that we know someone and we're able to connect that individual to another individual or from project to project, peer to peer, and ensure the success of every um, member and value their voice. And when we have our membership meetings, I mean, they're open. And so people are able to comment and bring forward great ideas, create new board positions if we're seeing um, an area we can strengthen and create new like digital platforms to share even our institutional history. So I love the fact that we created social media together in Long Beach. I remember asking Marcy Gallo, I was like, we need an Instagram. I know we have a Facebook page, but how about we go and set that up right now? She said, okay. <laughs> so, you know, creating cute pictures and little montage from our 35th to now and seeing that we have, um, you know, strategic hashtags for events on our digital programs. We have a web news site that celebrates and espouses like these longer articles and interviews with each of you. There's an oral history project right now, um, capturing the voices of our institutional history right now. So we have an, a place to archive this, a digital place to save all this um, ephemera. I mean, this program's digital and it went onto our, you know, our site. And so it should be there in perpetuity if we're doing the right backups and server things that I just think is it's just so critical that we have a place to save um, digital history as well. So it, I think COVID has legitimized the importance of digital collections more and more. We have um, a historian who, Joyce Moore, who's been so uh, active in keeping our special collections boxes and all the ephemera there. But we've also done, I think, a great job in capturing the digital voice and the next generation of we we ask students um, all the time as they go to sessions you know take snapshots you know send them to our newsletter it's all digital there we still print it but you know we've learned um, to adapt to the culture and its needs and I I think having that remote workshop last year was so tremendous I think back to the time where we were all looking at each other and saying how do we conduct an interview we've lost the power of a rapport in person and how do we communicate effectively with this person through this means of communication? How can we actually translate this to be as powerful and meaningful as we would in person? And so I think SOHA led a wonderful workshop at the you know very start of this conversation. It was just so amazing to say um, we, we were prepared. We had resources, we had some answers, and we still were still figuring some of that out. And I think that was what was great about that session was that we acknowledged there are you know limitations and bandwidth connections and challenges with audio and lighting, all the things that make a good interview and as far as the lookability of a video, but the quality of a conversation can still happen through this means. And so I think um, our network strengthened its ties with OHA and we look to a wider network. That's why we're here is just to say we, we're in this together. <laughs> this is why we celebrate our victory 40 years of a nonprofit. And you know, a lot of less last year is difficult for some groups. And yeah, we we continue to look forward and project an amazing future and make plans for an in-person hybrid conference and look for submissions and already looking for student proposals that will shape hopefully their careers as much as it has shaped each of ours. I think that's what I think about, just this, this arch of experience that we all have from our graduate studies to post-career <laughs> and running a business now and having had this experience of running this amazing network and to each of you who have been central, central part in in the in the roles that we have all played so i thank each of you too for the journeys you've taken with us and shaping the next generation as you mentor and create a new um, leadership through it oh thank you so much jennifer and you know jennifer working with you I, it was amazing how much you gave soha this larger platform you know on social media and using all these different mediums that you knew how to navigate, you know, as 
Karen talked about the days when it's like we were learning email, you know, we're learning uh, web web pages, and we're still learning all these technologies, right? No one's any. It's it feels like it changes every day. Um, so Jennifer was just very attuned to that and finding all these different um, projections, you know, ways to connect uh, people to connect with Soha beyond the conference, which was really incredible. And in that sense, it's gone from a very regional place, you know, where it was, wherever people could gather to having global connections, um, which has really been an interesting part of conversations in Soha, how I've met, um, I mean, I, I studied African history uh, for my master's and was you know, hoping to pursue African studies. Then I had uh, a turnaround to work with my home communities in Navajo country, but my heart is really connected with friendships I made there. And I met a Yoruba, you know, student of, of a language I studied while at the University of Wisconsin through Soha, <laughs> through the boot camp. Wow. And I was like, what? Follow me. You know, I was able to talk to him in, in Yoruba. And it's just really amazing the kind of connections because um, COVID, you know, has challenged us in so many ways. And I just have to say that just like Juan said of Soha being a lifeline in some ways, that's, that's what his comment made me think about is it, it was for me definitely over such a hectic time and, and we were scrambling of what to do with the conference. What do we do with this, uh, all these different dynamics? All of you, you know, were a part of that um, on this panel, even Sarah jumping in um, as a treasurer, you know, when she wasn't fully expecting that <laughs> surprise. Um, so, so being willing to step up and um, do it, you know, as I said, in ways that, that certainly have been so meaningful and powerful for each of you, but I, I just also want to reiterate and emphasize, I know like how each of you have influenced me and really broadened my understanding of oral history, of humanity, you know, of relationships between people. And when it's really a hard time, you know, these are unprecedented historic times in terms of death, tragedy, real hardship, you know, that, um, and, and divisive in all that. I constantly see a theme of Soha and from each of you sharing how it, it reminds us, you know, we're people and we're human. And um, that that's what really matters. Um, and how do we have hope? How do we, how do we have unity and come together? Not that that unity is conformity, you know, or having to, impose ourselves on each other but real respect of humanity and that so I, i've just um admired learning and and we all have our different ways of doing that um and i'm glad you know that sarah has brought up for example connecting and, and i think she wants to say this in a minute but but connecting with the action community and building a relationship with them as they've been a primary sponsor and support of the eva tuline watt award and, and different communities that we've also been able to connect with, not just individuals, but really have um, backing of different communities. Did you wanna say anything about that, Sarah? Because I know you mentioned it. Yeah, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, yeah. Well, Farina just said it very well, but um, Keith, Bas Keith Basso passed away. I can't remember exactly what year it was. And at that point, he and Mary had donated quite a bit of money each year to bring more Native Americans. And at that point, we decided it was time <clears throat> to look for an institution. And the Ak Chin had sent um, some participants to our conference for several years. And so they were a natural. And also, they're in the Phoenix area. And so we went to them and their tribal council, uh, council has been very generous in donating every year until the pandemic, of course, when the casinos were closed and so their source of revenue really dried up. But um, <clears throat> they have been just wonderful. Want to make sure that uh, they get credit for what they have done 
to help SOHA throughout these years and bring and make sure that we are able to continue with this very, very important scholarship. And I'd just like to mention, it's great to hear from the other past presidents and they're so good about not giving themselves a credit, but um, all of them have done a lot for SOHA. So thanks to them and you, Farina, and everyone else who has kept SOHA going. Thank you for adding that. Um, we still do have time. If people have any questions, you know, that they want to put in the chat or for the panelists, if you have questions for each other, please feel, you know, comfortable and open to doing, you know, sharing that um, what what you would like to. Um, so, I I. Uh, want to also do another echo a shout out to what Jennifer said about how SOHA is launching an oral history project for our own institution. <laughs> it, it's really interesting. I mean, it hit me and we had been talking about this with the big 40, the 40th anniversary coming up. Um, Jennifer had started to launch the call for stories, memories, asking any SOHA members to share any thoughts that they wanted. Um, and we are we did that call also for our award ceremony tomorrow that I am scrambling to put together <laughs> a little video that, that we did even for our virtual conference in 2020. And wow, that was a roller coaster year. I'm sure all of us uh, can share from that. And I know different folks here on the panel, they participated in the boot camp that we had during the pandemic, a virtual boot camp, they participated in different membership meetings that we had to transfer to online. Um, they helped exchange and talk about ideas, as as uh, others have mentioned already, of how can we continue oral history work when it was such a uh, direct, you know, interpersonal relationship that you build. Is it possible virtually? Um, and I think. Through all this, I would argue that it is, right? That that we have sustained and continued this oral history work, even in this medium, that here we are, you know, regularly uh, pre-COVID, OHA, we would be in a room together. We would be sitting together. But in a way, because of this, you know, we're able to hear each other, listen to each other, record this. And in and I would say this is these are stories and these are memories that are certainly going to be a part of our archive and a part of what we're growing with that connection with the UNLV libraries and Joyce Moore there as our historian. So I'm working with Joyce Moore to follow up and, and go the step further um, with uh, asking folks like Sarah, Karen, you know, Jennifer, Juan, everyone here and others who couldn't join us today because we do know there's many others uh, mentioned. Marcy, we wish she could be here with us. She was originally scheduled to and she certainly offers her regrets and she would be here if she could. And I know so many others. So here's an opportunity as well that we will have to um, talk with past presidents, leaders, members, whoever want to share um, these various memories from SOHA. As I know, I don't have to preach to the choir, but it always helps us to get that uh, momentum going and excitement of how important it is to understand our own organization, how we enter it. Um, when I came into SOHA, you know, I didn't realize there's all this, well, I didn't know all the history, all the dynamics behind it, right? And it's as if you walk into it and you're trying to make sense of it, of, of things that you are um, coming into contact with the people or the way things work, you know, or, or, or are going with that organization. And so it was kind of a topsy-turvy world for me at first of like, what's going on? What's the Minka Horty? I was a student, like uh, Juan said, you know, before I was a professor, that's when I got involved in SOHA. So it also did help me um, to have a space where I felt it was a smooth a transition where it wasn't so hard hitting, thrown in the deep end of academia and, being able to have people who like would take that time and were excited to talk with me or what I found when I was a student is there were some people who just had a, had 
kind of, I don't know if they meant to or not in their attitude, maybe they're just so busy, but they often were pretty dismissive in a way of being like, oh, you don't have a name. You're not famous. I'm not going to talk to you. You don't have your letters behind your name yet. And I had those moments that were really um, hard. And I think that's what Juan was getting at too. And so going to Soha where people were happy that I was there, I really hope we can sustain that spirit and and help you know show people this is a space. And, and that's what I like about it, not being, um, that it, it it is a smaller organization, but I like that <laughs> about it because then you can actually have time to recognize people in the hallways, get to know them, talk to them. And um, in ways that it's growing, we're still trying the best to um, sustain, to continue that kind of dynamic with Soha. And that that's what I appreciate about it. Karen. Yeah, jump in anyone if they want. Karen, you're on mute. I'm gonna ask you. If I'm still, if Mary Larson is still here, she was there on the board when I was on the board and I'm hoping you have some memories you'd like to throw in. Yay. Thank you for being here, Mary. Good to see you. Yes, please. Always do. good to see you too, Karen and, and Sarah and everybody. And Farina, I was going to say we <laughs> we're in state, you know. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, I one of the, one of the things that I think everybody has alluded to is is the friendships. Um, some of the people I know from Soha are still some of my dearest friends, um, and that that goes for Oha too. But you know, Soha was a very very good intimate intellectual space mm. you know from someone who i mean i'm i'm very public facing i mean in terms of i like to think i'm public facing in terms of the work i do i mean that's my intent i've, I've always been at land grant universities because i'm a farm kid originally and the academic stuff is there but if you're not doing it for the public why are you doing it um and I, I loved that about Soha and the fact that it was very grassroots oriented, but, but also the fact that you could make friends so quickly because it was a manageable size. And it's a very supportive group. I remember when I finally, after taking the scenic route, finished my um, <laughs> doctoral dissertation. <laughs> Karen's laughing because she remembers this. Um, it was, and I was thousands of miles away from where my my dissertation committee was, and um, had been for some time. And I finished, and bless their hearts, the rest of the board. We were we were at a board meeting down in San Diego, I think it was, and and it was we were just having a board. I think it was just a board meeting, and. Um, I had seen this beautiful Audrey Hepburn hat that I just thought, oh, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I still have it, by the way. Um, but I wasn't going to buy it because it was just too, too, too. Um, but this wonderful group of people on the board bought me that hat. And it is one of my prized possessions to this day. And I'm, I'm trying to remember, I think, on the board at the time, Karen, I know you were there. Melanie was there. I think Wendy was there. I think Susan Douglas Yates may still have been on the board at the time. Um, but it, it was a wonderful, close group of people who were very supportive, you know, even when we were just slogging along trying to get things, get things done. I think that was a celebration hat for you finishing your PhD, wasn't it? Yep, it was. It was. I remember we just, um, you, you talked about it and we said, we got to get that for you. Yeah, I'd looked at it. I'd looked at it twice and hadn't bought it. And, and yeah. <laughs> and I, like I said, I still have it, one of my prized possessions, but. Um, well, what about the velvet painting of Elvis? <laughs> That's also still a prized possession. <laughs> Mary, you're going to have to bring that hat next time we meet in person. I next will. Conference in person. You're going to have to. I will. You're have and to I, will that. I will actually bring Black Velvet Tijuana Elvis, too, <laughs> because this was a thing of beauty. Um, it was it was at one of the one of the silent auctions. 
at OHA. Yes. And but it was a joint SOHA OHA meeting, mm -hmm. wasn't it? Yeah. Oh. No? no, it was just an OHA. Okay. Well, I had been, I had wanted, I had coveted black this black velvet Elvis. And um they pulled out the name and someone else had, Karen had gotten it, but she put in a ticket for me. Mm -hmm. So it's like all of, all of my favorite things, you know? <laughs> um, but I, 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 I think too, I mean, one of the, one of the things I really loved about Soha um, was how much outreach, mm -hmm. you know, with workshops. And I mean, we were talking about this the other day, uh, yesterday, I guess it was, when we were talking about trying to get a Midwest oral historians group kind of up and up and rolling. And I was saying that one of the things that was so important about Soha was it was more accessible for people who felt intimidated by a national level organization. You know, people aren't going to necessarily go call OHA or someone from OHA or go to an OHA workshop. But if it's something a little more local or regional, um, you're much more likely to get the folks from the local historical societies or, or the folks from the community projects that are so important to why we do what we do. And, and I think that that regional outreach is, is so critical. And that's something that SOHA has always done beautifully because that's where everybody's heart is. Thank you. Sorry, I said too much. <laughs> oh, no, we're so happy. We'd love to talk and hear hear more from you. It's so nice to that you could join us, Mary, and, and share those thoughts too. Um, it reminds me as well that um, with all the funding, you know, I, I've been impressed in terms of how people have come together to fund, to bring people, include them. Um, and there was a president's, uh, it was a president scholarship that people did too for a while to help um, rally and bring, bring funding in so people could come and, and the generosity, you know, of um, members and presidents doing that was really um, blew me away. It was, it, it was so wonderful. Um, Sarah, uh, it, Jennifer had some points she added in the chat about um, a photo she found and please check out, let's see. Oh, sorry. And then Sarah as well. But I, I wanted to share because Jennifer brought this up and I'll let her say, oh, and, and Juan has something he wants to say. But I wanted to share my screen really quickly of showing the list of past presidents um, because of what Jennifer just pointed out of uh, the, the list is out there. So let me put this on present because it'll, <laughs> it'll look better. Oh, no, 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 not share. I want present. Um, so you can see it clear here, but this is a list um, of past presidents and we certainly will be acknowledging them at the award ceremony with our, our Mink awardees over the years too. And Jennifer, you said you found an image of Steve, Stephen Stern. Was it with Shirley Stevenson? Do you want to say something about that? Yeah, so for the 50th, it looks like the Oral History Association did a throwback. And it's so interesting to see the common leadership between SOHA and OHA. Like OHA. So this picture is pretty fun. If you click on it, you'll see Stephen and Shirley together. And so it just really reminds us like the fiber of um, how how we we were able to have a celebration um, for our 35th and 50th in Long Beach. And there's so much overlap, obviously, being a regional organization with those um, who I've been able to work with. I mean, at that meeting, I was uh, doing local arrangements with Karen, and she was really giving us guidance as to how to make all those local arrangements, which is no easy feat, especially at the size and this group um, with um, national group coming to Long Beach at the aquarium and just making every you know recommendation and knowing the lay of the land is really key to have. Um, those are just you know amazing gifts that people offer is this you know sitting committees and from Mink to local to program to scholarship. There's just so many things that each of you have done and everybody on the board 
from prior have served. And so it just kind of makes you reflect about all the years and um, how meaningful this network has to sustain the work and train new people who are interested um, in this field. So I hope we can continue the torch and lead and <laughs> stay connected to our national group who has been such a great partner and um, seen us um, through it, I, I was just thinking about 2020 and Allison, who I called. I said, Allison, you know, this is a tough year. <laughs> what do we do? I know you're in California, you're in, you know, up north. What are you guys planning this year? This is a little tricky. We've never seen this, <laughs> you know. So Allison Tracy, you know, sat in through some of our um, meetings and just really, again, you just sense the camaraderie. It meant a lot to know that National had her back in that and had um, thoughts and actionable items and so we we worked with the texas history association that year too just really trying to get a sense of how they were planning and they just ran their hybrid program and you know virtual so this is why we celebrate we work together we sustain each other's work just because you see where we're able to go in the years of history and how it's all woven this beautiful tapestry of who we are as um, organizations so I feel lucky to have been a part of all this. You look back and see the legacies and um, the work that's been put forward. So what a great, great thing to celebrate. So the award ceremony is going to be fun. I know you're going to do a great job <laughs> with that and a lot of great memories. So we're looking forward to continuing this. Thanks. Mitch had her hand up uh, a little while ago. No, oh, who did? Sorry. Thanks, Juan. Thanks for looking out for me, Juan. Sorry, um, I didn't see. Thank you. No, I just, I don't have a question. I just wanted to make a couple comments. This has been really fun here today. And, you know, those of you on the panel, I know all of you, but I don't know your stories, your SOHA stories. And so this has been uh, really fun to sit here today and, and listen to your stories and your uh, involvements and experiences with SOHA. Um, you know, I've just been a part of SOHA since 2017 and uh, am sitting on the board for the second time now. And I, I really enjoyed uh, your funny stories that you had to share. And I think probably one of the things that I'm always going to remember about SOHA was how I first became involved with the board. And I don't know how many of you were at Tempe in 2017. But I actually walked into the business meeting uh, on accident. I was, you know, a graduate student and presenting for the first time that year. And I thought I was walking into a session. And I saw Farina. I was a little bit embarrassed. And I just sat down real quick next to Farina. And like literally within 60 seconds, I had been nominated and voted in to be the uh, student representative. <laughs> and so that's how I started. Um, you know, my engagement here with, with Soha, and I can look back on that now and laugh about it, I always will. And it was such a wonderful experience for me to, to sit on the board. And I'm now the Native American representative um, and, you know, have some ideas for my position and some things that I would like to see us do. Um, so I'll be throwing those things out in our board meetings. But, you know, listening to all of you, um, you know, you all talked about how SOHA is such a big part of your careers and the work that you do now, and I can say the same. Uh, if it wasn't for Farina being my professor and my mentor and introducing me to oral history and introducing me to SOHA and getting me engaged, I wouldn't be doing the work that I'm doing now in the Muscogee Nation, uh, which is extremely important work. And so, uh, you know, I have SOHA to thank for that, which I do say in the video clip uh, that I sent in for tomorrow. But anyway, thank you guys for all your work, uh, for your examples. Um, I hope to continue staying engaged with SOHA because I've learned so much uh, from all of you. So thank you. We're happy to have you, Midge. We're happy to have you. Thank you, Midge. That's awesome. And I mean, I, I definitely appreciate all of you sharing the stories of why, why do we invest? You know, why, why do we really give of ourselves to have these connections together? And 
Um, I want to give you all, we have a few minutes remaining before we have to wrap up, just four minutes. So maybe if each of you could share in, you know, a few seconds, a minute, um, any parting thoughts, words, and, and those are so beautiful from our audience too. If you want to add anything more, we would love that because those are so powerful as well. You're a part of the story. You're a part of SOHA. And those who are listening, you know, learning, we're, we're grateful you're here listening as well and joining us um, because it, it's just as powerful to speak is, is listening, being able to listen and, and respect and honor our stories and um, know that, you know, this is the tip of the iceberg in a lot of ways. There's so much, like I, like Karen's stories, I said, the stories within the stories and so much there of, of, and everyone, what you all were bringing up. And I can say that too, right, is maybe my words is that I, I learned and have been just amazed how Soha introduced me to people who I probably never would have met any other way. Sarah was one of the first individuals um, of Soha working with the scholarship committee at that time, for example, or even everyone here on this panel, other than Midge, who was in my class, but I got to know Midge better because of Soha, you know, in our um, partnerships and work collaboration through Soha, I got to work with her in ways um, that I didn't in the classroom even. So it's been wonderful how as an educator, a mentor, or, you know, a human being, I'm also getting beyond the classroom and having these opportunities to um, that Soha, it, it provides an avenue for. Um, but yeah, like I said, there's been times I don't agree with everyone in Soha, or I've, I, people have said things that I'm like, Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> it, it really hurt or something. But what I, why I'm still here and why I, I share this is because it's, it's really taught me how important it is um, back to what Karen said of human beings, we like to be always in our comfort zones. We like to click to our, to our birds of a feather or whatever and, and stick together. Um, but it's pushed me to realize that even when we disagree or we come from very different backgrounds and perspectives, it's taught me so much in terms of how important it is to still talk to and meet people who may not always agree with you, who come from very different standpoints and backgrounds. And we all have something to learn from each other and it matters. And what I've realized of everyone I've met through Soha, um, despite any kind of differences or, or whatever, is that they all, um, I've, I've been astounded by the heart, the desire to learn and humility that people have shown. Um, and you know, it can be rough and rocky sometimes, but it's been such a haven in that way. And I wouldn't trade that for anything. Anyway, but anyway, um, Jennifer, do you want to go? I think the idea of community is such a powerful one um, that you celebrate it and so have and you train others to build community um, through the collections that we develop. But I think having a forum. So I think that's one of the key definitions. If I could summarize that, it's just community. There's a strong community that you have and you maintain, even digitally, look at it. <laughs> we're still together in a way that we've been able to hybrid and adapt, so. <laughs> Sarah and Juan and Karen. Um, okay, I'd just like to mention listening to everyone. I know we, uh, Karen gave us a really strong base and um, <laughs> she said it to convince me that, you know, if they say, you're the only one who can do this, I'm happy you, you end up doing it. But I said, well, if you'll help me. And she did. And that's how we got going. But listening to everyone else, it's just wonderful to hear how they built on that base and brought in um, new aspects that have, have helped us so much, like Jennifer and Farina with their technical knowledge and knowing how to create the social media sites and all that. And we have a wonderful board right now and I expect them to continue the traditions of SOHA 
and just um, move on from there. So thank everybody for what you've done. <laughs>